Welcome everybody to our pro chat. Um, I do request that people turn off your video and your audio for now. Uh, we will get to a Q&A at some point, but as we collect people, if you can turn off your video and your audio, uh, that would be useful. And I will repeat that as more people uh, join us. So there are some people that are still sitting in the waiting room, even though I admitted them. <laughs> I'll, keep, I'll keep admitting people. Strange time to get cold feet. <laughs> they saw our faces. Yeah, you know, they you took can, one. When they took one look and went, "I'm out." You can, you can, you can sign up and then you know walk away from your computer and not realize you've been admitted. So, uh, good. welcome everybody as we're collecting. Uh, we'll we'll allow people to collect for another moment or two, and then um, I will. Uh, uh, pretty much all of you know me, of course. I'm Elise Dewsbury. I'm the artistic director of New Musicals Inc. in uh, Los Angeles. And um, uh, this is a series that we've been doing uh, over the last couple of years called Pro Chat, where we uh, chat with some people in the business about some arena of the business. And um, uh, just to give us all some more um, information as we pursue this crazy business of writing new musicals. Um, and our host for today is going to be our member representative and artistic associate, Michael Gordon Shapiro. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Michael to intro our guests and let us know how things are going to work today. Uh, so Michael, take it away. Thanks very much, Elise. Uh, I am very pleased today to be chatting with Lawrence Owen and Lindsay Sherman, who are in one of the windows you see arrayed in your Zoom uh, quadrants. Uh, I became aware of these two because they were making some rather brilliant comedic literary, ins literarily inspired musicals at uh, the Edinburgh Fringe. And uh, I, I saw some of these shows, and I've just been keeping an eye on them over the years, not not in an intrusive way, in a kind of artistic <laughs> way. And um, lately, I, I realized they were doing some really interesting audio dramas, uh, including a podcast musical. And I think the medium of podcast musicals is really interesting in that it offers certain things that are not available on stage and has some challenges that are not presented to people developing stage musicals. So, I'm going and searching for the lost art. Not sure where that came from. Anyway, uh, we're going to encourage everybody to uh, mute and turn off everything until the Q&A at the end, at which point we can have a booming, buzzing confusion of, of questions and attempts to answer them. But for now, um, hello, uh, Lawrence and Lindsay. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Uh, I thought we'd start with perhaps a very broad, sweeping self-introduction. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about your earlier stage musicals and then perhaps what got you interested in podcast uh, audio. Cool. <laughs> Where do we start? <laughs> well, so uh, should we give a rundown of anything we've done on stage? Yeah, yeah. So we 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 met on the, the comedy circuit Um but we've done all sorts of different things over the many years. We've both been actors and uh, uh, all sorts of other things, but that's where we met. And we started making uh, shows for the Edinburgh Fringe um, about in sort of mid 2010s, 2014, yeah. 15. Yeah, well, your first one that we collaborated on was a kind of pastiche of different genres in a musical format sort of thing. It was like a take on scoring. lots of different film scoring types. Mm. It was called Cine Musical. Uh, and it was like a sort of uh, a ridiculous one man show, which we co-wrote where uh, I would play all sorts of different characters. Uh, each of them are kind of a stock character from, um, from uh, a different type of film, a different genre of film. So we had a sort of a James Bond henchman. I played a Disney princess. So I played a, uh, uh, who else was there? Like a like a gunslinger, but it was kind of an excuse to dip into lots of different types of film music, and the, the music was in it. Uh, in it was very wide ranging and uh, and silly and eclectic. Yeah, and then we did um, Time Machine. Mm -hmm. So we did a, a musical version of Time Machine and uh, a Jekyll versus Hyde sort of thing. Uh, and then we got really frustrated with the limitations of fringe theatre and our own limitations <laughs> as performers. And uh, we went into podcast audio drama uh, and that eventually led to The Ballad of Anne and Mary, which is our big musical. Yes. So we've been a podcast production company now for three years. 
Um, we have three podcasts that we have made and continue to make. Uh, the biggest show that we have is called Mockery Manor, which is a uh, murder mystery drama series, uh, comedy drama set in a theme park in the 1980s and, uh, and subsequently the 90s. We have Madame Magenta, who is your creation. Yeah, I came up with her on the cabaret circuit about oh, 10 years ago, I think, probably longer, actually. Wow. Yeah. And um, it, that's just us pissing around, really. There is I mean, it's just, pretty much, <laughs> it's just, yeah. Uh, comedy improv, really, yes, and it's comedy. very easy to put together, whereas everything else we do is so meticulously constructed, whereas Magenta and Lawrence plays my husband, Bernard, and it's, uh, yes. that's just us mucking around. It's like comedy improv storytelling. Yeah. But then, yeah, The Ballad of Anne and Mary, which is our full full cast musical, uh, was, a, was a huge project. It was entirely a lockdown project, interestingly, so none of the cast met at any point no one was in the same room as anyone else and because it was lockdown we managed to get some people who would otherwise be working i think yeah yeah, <laughs> so yeah. We, got, we got a really great cast it was it, one of the very few ways in which the pandemic was slightly advantageous to us um we actually yeah were able to work with some people who we probably wouldn't have got the opportunity to work with otherwise yeah but, now, if um, I can uh, rudely interject for a moment, um, sure. you're doing a great job with this super speedy overview of your of your process and past. There's <laughs> one point I'd like to zoom in on a little bit, which is what made podcast audio and podcast musicals interesting to you? Um, what what aspects about the medium first motivated you to start experimenting and doing productions that way? Uh, so, uh, as I touched on, we were getting quite frustrated with the limitations of fringe theatre. I mean, the the literal kind of the, the space that you have, uh, the amount of time you have to get in and get out, uh, the fact that uh, there's not a lot of money in that, and so and so we were basically only ever working with us as the cast because we couldn't really say to someone else, "Well, you could, but we didn't want to." You know, come and join us in Edinburgh for a month and the pay will be absolutely rubbish. <laughs> so there were just all these limitations, which meant that I was having to write to those limitations. And, you know, you can say that, well, in that way, you, you have to get really inventive and isn't that fun? But after a while, it's it's not fun. <laughs> like, like I feel like we, we had been plenty inventive with, you know, a, a small space and no budget for, for some time. And the great thing about audio, uh, and, you know, recorded audio is you there are there's basically no limit to the scale of the mm. production you can yeah. tell epic enormous stories and it doesn't you know there, there is no limitation to what you can yeah do. there's no let's pretend this box is a roller coaster you know yeah. as, as you have to do on stage it can be no we're going to construct an entire theme park yeah and we're going to do it uh, down to the smallest of details we're going to make it feel like you're walking through something which would cost an obscene amount of money to construct uh, in, an, in any other medium. Yeah, it would be ex obscenely expensive to to put on stage, and it would be even more expensive to yeah. put on the screen. Or you'd have rubbish little cardboard props or something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. I think we just wanted to do something that we felt was kind of uh, that big. Yeah, epic. big. It it, uh, sounded expensive. Yeah, <laughs> our ambition was outstripping our budgets, and yes. so we had to find a way to do it. And audio is is a great way to do it. And having done Mockery Manor, which was a, which was a uh, it has songs in it, but it's more of an audio drama. We then thought, well, why not let's combine all of those things and, and make a full scale musical. And with respect to division of labor on your scripted projects, uh, Lindsay, you are typically the writer, and Lawrence, you're writing music, you're doing sound design and editorial. Is that right? That's right. Yes. So, so uh, we can we kind of co-direct as well. Though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We um, we it's it's all kind of uh, intertwined. So we um, we sort of we well, get involved in each other's stuff yeah, yeah. quite a lot. But. I'm I'm not musical, so <laughs> <laughs> I've got opinions. <laughs> Although I try not to impinge on no on you, your side, and actually, you don't tend to. Getting we have stuff, we have actually. respect for uh, our you know individual uh, expertise, yeah. but uh, we talk and collaborate a lot on every yeah. aspect. Of Although it. sometimes I am a bit more cowbell. Yeah, <laughs> you can be a bit more cowbell. 
But I try to, yeah, I recognise how annoying that is. <laughs> so I do try and pull that back. But what we, what, um, before I start on a song, um, you will have, for the most part, beaten out the story. You'll quite often give me uh, a kind of, okay, here's where we need to begin with and here's where we need yeah, to Yeah, I'll do the story of the song. So what needs to happen, what kind of emotions are going to be uh, put forward, mm. what the subtext is, where we need to be at the end as opposed to where we are at the beginning, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't try and do lyrics, though, because uh, that, you're so good at that. and So I just wouldn't want to... So, yeah, what... Uh, Lindsay will often provide to me as a sort of verse version of the song, and mm. then I will, uh, sorry, a prose version of it, and yeah. then I will versify it. That's very interesting. Uh, so we can make this a little more concrete. Could you give us just a brief introduction to the Ballad of Anne and Mary, what the subject matter is, and maybe the the musical framework that you've been using for the songs and underscore? So uh, the Ballad of Anne and Mary is a fictionalized. Uh, telling of the uh, story of the pirates Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. It's set in uh, 1721. Um, and in our story, um, we've played slightly fast and loose with uh, the facts a little bit, but we have uh, the two pirates in Newgate Prison, uh, which in fact, they never were in Newgate Prison, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, they are in Newgate Prison telling their story to a journalist who uh, is actually, uh, who was actually a real person, uh, Nathaniel Mist, who it's thought uh, is the author of a book called The General History of the Pirates, which is pretty much the, um, the, the sort of the most prominent and, and known account of all of these pirates. It's kind of the origin of everything we know about, or, or uh, not everything we know about pirates, it's the origin of that kind of like romantic idea of uh, pirates. Mm. So you, you can trace pretty much, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, the, the sort of jauntiness of that sort of thing, uh, the daring do and all the rest of it back to uh, a history of pirates. Mm. And they did actually think Daniel Defoe had written it originally, but then uh, with a bit more digging, they realised it was this chap called Nathaniel Mist. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was kind of taking vague historical facts. There's, there's really not much known about Anne, Bonnie and Mary Reed, so I could I could take what was known and then I could just do what I wanted with it. Really. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and we had a few ideas about... Um, uh, freedom of the press and uh, uh, the demonization of women in history and, and in modern um, uh, tabloid media and things. And we shoehorned that into the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, or, or wove it in carefully. Yeah, thematically. Yeah. <laughs> wove it in. But it's, yeah, it ends up being, yeah, both a history uh, or telling the story of these pirates, telling the story of the journalist writing their story, and in itself is a bit of a kind of comment on the, the nature of stories themselves and not, never letting the truth getting in the way of a good story. We actually to like the to make things up. Yes. <laughs> Sorry to trot on you. Uh, there's a little bit of latency, so there's probably an uh, inevitable interruption at the end of uh -huh. it. But uh, so I apologize in advance for any, uh, any of that I might do. Not at all. Uh, I rather like the fact that you involved a you, you portrayed Mist as somebody who was already in trouble with the law because he'd been writing some you know bills of protest uh, against the government and it, it gave him his own um, conflict and problems to deal with uh, in addition to those of your two main characters. So it seemed like it was a very shrewd decision from a, a story standpoint. Well, uh, yeah. Once I started digging into who might have written. A history of pirates. Nathaniel Miss story was so interesting. Anyway, I thought, oh, this is a great character. And that's the good thing about history. Like some of the characters are just fully formed, <laughs> and then you can. Uh, and even if you don't have many uh, facts about what they were like as people, you do find out, for instance, that Nathaniel Miss was in Newgate something like thirteen times, uh, and he had a he had a, a a fight with Daniel Defoe outside of a, a theatre because he thought, because uh, Daniel Defoe was spying on him on behalf of the government. And, you know, all these amazing facts that that's pointed out that this was a man who was not afraid to put himself uh, in danger in order to tell the truth. And a really brilliant present that uh, Lawrence got me <laughs> not that long ago is, uh, so Nathaniel Mist had a, a newspaper and so I got to see what his actual writing, his prose was like. Um, 
uh, because we've got a, a sheet from one of these newspapers, and you can see the the uh, the fact that he's defending the Irish in this particular uh, article that I saw and uh, we, that we have now, and it was just really interesting to see subversion in action, I suppose. Mm, and and so a really exciting character who who is kind of like a parallel of the women as well. Like, you know, they're not they're having they're bucking trends and, and uh putting themselves in tremendous danger in order to live the life that they want to live as he did. So in a way, they're all pretty much the same. And I was uh, so I started from that point, I was like, yeah, let's play with that idea. Mm. And Lawrence, uh, could you talk a little bit about the music and in particular um, the degree to which you are blending folk music and perhaps uh, symphonic film score style traditions with maybe little hints of modernity here and there? Like I could hear like an electric bass underneath the, the folk instrumentation and maybe electric guitar thrown in sometimes as well. Uh, yes. what, what was the concept and how did that develop? Well, I think um, straight from the off, we we uh, were very keen to not make uh, something that sounds literally like it was from 1721. Mm. Uh, we didn't want to go pure folk, which you could do, and that would be, uh, you know, uh, again, an interesting thing to do. But we wanted to build into it some of the sort of epic scale of what we've come to expect from the sound of, you know, a pirate story. So. Um, I wanted the 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 folksiness to the, the kind of folk storytelling and uh, you know shanty tradition to be kind of audible in it, but I wanted it to yeah have the impact of yeah like a full orchestral uh, film score. Um, I wanted some of the grubbiness of something like Nick Cave or uh, you know a kind of dirtier rock sound to to be there because it's a, it was a hard life and a grubby existence and but also a lot of freedom and excitement and and uh and the love of these two women uh, is a, is a huge part of the story so it needed to sound um sort of equally gritty and romantic were two words i think we ended up using um so yeah and that that ended up with the sound that we that we ended up with which is yeah sometimes sondheim sometimes nick cave sometimes um uh, uh, Bear McCreary, sometimes Hans Zimmer. It was a, an interesting mixture of things uh, to play with, uh, but I hope it ended up with its own identity. It was certainly fun to write. The um, uh, I think the the hybridization is there, but it's also you, you don't hit people over the head with it. You don't have like a sudden cut to a raucous guitar solo. It feels like. <laughs> Um, if, you, if you'd had your way, you would have had more guitar solos. More guitar solos all the time. No, no, I, I think I liked the anachronisms because it allowed me to be anachronistic in the writing as well. Mm, yeah, yeah. In the story, rather. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that kind of melange uh, suited what we were doing. Like everything, it reflected everything else in a way. The music reflected the writing and yeah. the style that we were going for. So the story is told through, I believe, five episodes, which are approximately half an hour each. Uh, what challenges did you find in approaching this episodic medium for musicals? And in what way, what were things that maybe surprised you about working in an audio only medium that might not be obvious from the standpoint of an outsider? So I think the fun thing about audio drama and the episodic nature of it is that you can get really detailed with it. You can, uh, it's quite an intimate medium. It's right in your ears. So um, you could, uh, we could try and recreate the feeling of them being in the place. So it's not so much because it's, you can put a musical together and then get everyone in a studio and get them to sing the songs and, uh, and, and just treat it as a recording of a musical that still sounds like you're missing part of it because you're not there watching it on uh, on stage. Mm. But we wanted to tell the story in such a way that all the details were there. So we're painting the scenery for you. There's this, it's separate to, audio drama is separate to theatre and it's more akin to almost like a novel uh, slash film hybrid, wouldn't mm. you say? It's an interesting hybrid uh, of all, all sorts of uh, mediums. Uh, the the way that you act in audio drama, and then we're going off on a tangent here, but the way that you act on audio drama is is quite interesting because it's it's sort of 
bigger than screen, but not as big as theater. You can obviously, you know, your your the mic is right there. People are on headphones for the most part. You can really whisper, and it will pick it up. Yeah, we yeah we're always saying that to our actors. It's like you don't have to hit the the back wall. Or yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> this, in fact, it's so rare that you need anyone to speak above the sort of level that you get in TV. Where if you were in a room with someone and they were talking like that, you'd be like, "What? Sorry, what? Mm, what are you saying?" Mm. Like you you can get really hushed and really intimate with it. You can be there in the room with the characters. Yeah. And that's the really nice, freeing thing about audio drama, I think. Um, Most uh, analogous to maybe the camera in a, in a film musical, where it can show a level of detail of facial expression that you would never be able to convey on stage. Yeah, it's getting that, uh, it's going, well, we don't have micro expressions here, so we're going to have to somehow do that through dialogue and music and sound effects and all the rest of it. Mm. But yeah, it's, it's not forgetting those tiny little moments and figuring out a way to, to express them. That makes sense. And audio writing is particularly uh, interesting because if you're not careful, it can sound very clunky. So I think you spend a lot of time crafting lines that give you a lot of information without telling you literally what people are doing. Yeah, you don't want you don't want the characters to walk into a room and be like, ah, the kitchen where I will now make a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> you you want the the sound you you want to build a soundscape that does that for you mm-hmm. and have them uh, um, moving around in that environment in a way that communicates where they are without actually having to say it outright. And with good sound design, it's it's interesting how much you don't need to put in the script. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the time you'll just get it if you can hear what's going on mm. and then you, then you just write as normal yeah but yeah it's a, an interesting balance in that well, did we have any limitations what were the I, I guess that trying to avoid clunky exposition is one of the limitations but mm. well, one of the difficulties rather for audio drama sometimes you do actually have to chuck in a line which you'd rather not <laughs> You know, which a look, you know, the uh, uh, micro expressions or or action would do in a visual medium. You do sometimes have to just like <laughs> put it out there, although you can, you know, we try and avoid that as mm-hmm. much as possible. But are there any other there musical limitations? Or well, I mean, uh, not not really. That was the nice thing. I had I had more free reign with this than I would have on you know in virtually any other medium, really. Um, in terms of the kind of music I would make, I, I suppose uh, it's the, the same as making a film score or a TV score. But uh, you know, I, I could go from a solo guitar one moment to a full orchestra the next moment, and um, there are some things that uh, because it's only existing as recorded audio, this is, there's no plans for it to be done on stage or, or put to screen that, that we know of. <laughs> Um, you can do things like this in one of the songs, the percussion track is a galloping horse. So Anne is riding a horse uh, and this of the horse's gallop. Um, it, my thinking was, well, that's happening in the scene and it's such a rhythmic thing that uh, it would be wrong not to hear the horse and also you might might as well use that as the basis for the song. So that that song, Cut and Run, ended up being kind of built around a horse gallop rhythm because that's what she's doing. And then the song is essentially her thought process as she rides. So the songs are almost, in that instance, the song is like happening inside her head. Yeah, and the horse speeds up and slows down as per her emotional state, really. Yes, at one point the horse goes into a canter. And then, uh, and then the uh, the d- 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 became like the triplet, uh, the triplet rhythm of the original rhythm, if that makes sense. Uh, I noticed that effect, and what I really liked is, in addition to following her mental state as she changed from a very driving, excited mode to a more contemplative one, you could almost visualize the horse slowing down, reflecting the driver's uh, or the rider's mindset, which I thought was a really interesting effect. And then, uh, and then she goes, yeah, and then it, it, you hear the horse whinny and, uh, and then it speeds up again because she comes in with new resolve once, once more. Yeah, that was a fun song to write that. How do you approach song spotting when you're dealing with these 30-minute chunks of drama and the presumption that a listener might be hearing this episode but 
maybe they need to be motivated to to listen to the next one. How did you plot out how many songs would be in a given episode and where they would fall? That was really tricky, actually. Yeah, it, that got trickier as the denouement was happening because uh, I didn't want to interrupt the action for them to have a song <laughs> because it wasn't... Ah, uh, yeah. And, and so that was episode four uh, was the kind of like... Um, uh, rising action to the climax and it it was so hard to figure out how to get a song into that but I think in the end we figured out that we uh, well we, we did the sort of dream sequence one didn't we or rather he's uh, so Nathaniel Mist has been clonked on the head and he's unconscious and he almost enters the consciousness of uh, this cabin boy who was on the the ship Revenge when it um, when it was uh, taken by privateers mm. Uh, and that was the only way I had to kind of like drastically change timelines and uh, shift into a different mode, uh, sort of into a different storyline rather, in order to get a song in there that wasn't going to kind of like grind everything to a halt. It does. It was tricky. Yeah, it, it gives more context to the the backstory of the pirates and and ultimately you know Mist's decisions in the final episode are kind of informed by his experience yeah so yeah because that was another thing I thought I don't want to just put a song in episode four just to have a song in episode four Mm. but there's got to be a good solid reason for this and so it was a lot of like jiggling jigging things around Mm. and (laughs) but I suppose that the yeah, that that episode four of five uh, only has one song in it, and all of the others have multiple songs in. But one of the nice things about podcast as a medium is it doesn't entirely matter. We've not got two acts with an interval. It's not a show. It's its own thing. Yeah, and it can come in and out of being an audio drama if it wants, because no one's telling us what to do. <laughs> yeah, and you can have one episode that's forty minutes long mm. uh, because you want to end at this particular point that, like you say, drives people to the next episode, mm. um, uh, or you could have it twenty minutes long for exactly the same reason. Uh, so I think I think episode four also that um, different parts of a story, like it's pretty much a five act story in five episodes, different acts of different lengths as well. So I didn't want to just unnaturally elongate some of them and, and truncate other ones just to make them even. The nice thing about uh, what we do is that we get to choose the rules, basically. We don't have, you know, uh, anyone going, oh, well, it needs to be exactly this amount of time. We need to have this uh, with for the adverts, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's it's entirely up to us. So if we felt something was working dramatically, then we would go with it, even if it meant having a slightly shorter or longer episode or or what have you. Mm. Can you give us an overview of the production process? Um, And in particular, is this an iterative process? Do you workshop the show? Did you do an informal, uh, did you do a table read? Uh, At what point in production does the sound design come in? Can can you just kind of give us a big overview of of how uh, a show of this scope is constructed? Right. So we do, we have a lot of informal meetings because we live together <laughs> and are married. <laughs> so, so pretty much a lot of dinner times basically turn into what are we doing next? How are we doing it? Blah, blah. So uh, we probably clocked up like hundreds of hours of meetings. Yeah. Unofficial meetings. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, we had to think of it kind of money first in a way as well. So we applied. Uh, we had we I had the idea. I wrote the first episode. Um, we talked about the music and then we were like, we need some money in order to put this on, uh, to do this. So we applied for a, an Arts Council grant um, uh, in order to be able to pay the actors properly. And then when we got the money, it was kind of like, right, so, uh, let's go. So then I wrote, I think uh, it was, it, it's a really kind of fluid process at the beginning because I was writing the episodes and while you were writing the music and we were talking about it backwards and forwards but the music was um sort of experimental for ages wasn't it because you didn't want to pin down any songs until the scripts were done yeah and we were uh you were beating out the story um and sort of earmarking this section as being this is a song here, mm. and, and then this is another song and this could be a song um so yeah to eventually uh, we were kind of working simultaneously, me writing songs and you working on the scripts, but it took a little while to get there. Mm. 
Although I did give you a ridiculous deadline, which I... <laughs> <laughs> you did, but uh, that's fine. We, we got there eventually. <laughs> I was like, Lawrence will do all the music in two weeks. <laughs> no, it wasn't quite that bad. Yeah. But, uh, and then, then what happened? So then we uh, um, booked all the actors and we did, I think, so three main characters and Mary and Nathaniel... And I think we did Nathaniel in three, two days? Mm, two like two that. days. Uh, two or three, I can't remember. Yeah. I think it was like two and a half sessions. Uh, Anne, how long did Anne take? Loads. We, but we did each actor separately. So we were doing them remotely. So um, we would Zoom, uh, do it over Zoom, we'd direct, we'd play all the other parts that weren't there. Um, and they would record on their end and send us uh, what they had. Mm. So it was a, it, to put it together was like a huge jigsaw puzzle because it was a very unnatural way of, of doing something like this because of the nature of we were doing this in, in full lockdown. It was when the pandemic was absolutely at its height. Beginning to end, how, uh, how long did recording the access take if we um, all that together? Because we were working around their schedules as well, but their schedules were pretty much wide open because of the pandemic, which was handy. Mm. Um for us it was about two months i think of uh recording uh just recording yes yeah yeah bits and bobs here and there it took ages some things i wasn't a party to so you did the musical direction didn't you so yeah i didn't bother to sit in on those particular sessions so when we when we were uh recording dialogue we would be reading the lines over zoom and having them record their parts on on the other end but for music uh, i would just direct them in a zoom session and then let them go away and, and do it themselves because I didn't want to be sort of sitting on their shoulder while they're trying to sing is is not very comfortable and we you know you, we we had full confidence in them and you know they all did great so. there was a bit of backwards and forwards as well wasn't yeah because the the great thing about this process is that you can cut bits together as well you can really micromanage it you can go oh I like this half a line here mm. and uh, oh let's mm. you know let's actually completely make a line from the ground up using <laughs> bits and pieces of uh, different recordings and stuff. Yeah. So actually that that is the majority of the time was dialogue splicing, essentially. Yeah. Gluing everyone together. You had to sort out the different, the, the fact that people record in different environments. So you were getting different types of raw footage, weren't you? People's people's raw audio was was very different using different mics and, and trying to get them to to, yeah, sit next to each other in the same virtual world was extremely difficult. Uh, I was tearing my hair out at this. Uh, one of our performance microphones was just sounded so different and weird compared to everyone else. It took ages to get them to all sound like they were together. And but sometimes they'd have to sound like they were in a prison cell. Sometimes they'd be on a ship. Mm. You know, they were in really hugely different environments that you had to place them in. Yeah. And so that took <clears throat> ages. From, from the start to finish I think um in terms of like us having the scripts ready mm. um so they were, they were ready in January yeah it and took about six months yeah did we re I thought we released sooner than that I thought well we, we released started sooner. releasing in May yeah but oh yeah we started releasing and we hadn't actually finished all the episodes no. so we released them weekly and played catch up essentially yeah 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 but we were I was confident Lawrence could do it because <laughs> yeah. by that point my role was kind of over. It, it was, it was, yeah, it was really. It was probably the hardest I've ever worked on anything. Yeah, um, that period. I mean, we're making it sound like it was uh, like it was some kind of huge uh, onerous task. It was big and it took ages, but it was really enjoyable. Oh yeah, massively. Yeah, uh, yeah it really kept our peckers up during the pandemic, yeah, didn't totally, it? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that's striking about this uh, particular musical is just the quality of the performances, uh, both the, the many performances that you two contribute and also some of the cast that you've brought in, uh, a child actor or an apparent child actor, someone who sounds convincingly like, like a child, I guess I should say. Oh, that's good. She'll be she'll be pleased to hear that because, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah she's, uh, she's not a child actor. Amazing. <laughs> well, you, you passed the test because I couldn't tell. I really thought you'd had some, you know, prodigy. Um, how did what resources did you did you draw from in order to find such a high caliber cast? Uh, mainly our network. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we knew uh, the actors playing Anne and Mary. You know, we were we were on friendly terms with them. So 
it, we uh, we paid them, uh, you know, professional rates and everything. But I guess we got to chat to them in a way that was, you know, on a friend basis, yeah. which is very useful for this kind of project. But the the guy who played Nathaniel, we um, uh, you share a voice agent with him, don't you? So yes. so we just went through lots of different actors, and we were like, oh oh, this guy's this guy's Hamilton in Hamilton. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Could we get him? And we got him, uh, which we were thrilled about. Yeah, so he's he's uh, he's no longer doing it, but yeah, he was Hamilton on the West End, which uh, was he's quite a a, quite a coup for us. And yeah, it yeah, helped us a lot with promoting the thing as well to, mm. be able to kind of go look. Here's some some ped- serious pedigree. Here. Yeah, and he does a lot of uh, video game um, stuff as well. So mm. he's a, he's a great voice actor. Yeah, yeah. And who else? Legato Chocolat. Oh yeah. So uh, we both spent a lot of time on the comedy and cabaret circuit so we knew Gatto oh no we didn't know Gatto no we didn't know him before this no but we knew people who knew him and we thought oh that'd be a really interesting casting and then Hayley in fact who plays uh, his who you believed was a child actor she's actually uh, uh, our lead in Mockery Manor our other show she plays the the two main characters in in that Mm. so we would worked with her a lot already so it was a lot of this a lot of drawing upon uh, our own extended network and dipping into a few other people who were uh, much more available than they would normally be because of it being pandemic time. Um, yeah, and knowing the quality of their voices as well. So mm. obviously you don't want a load of people in a scene in audio drama who have the same vocal quality and some of whom might even sound like each other. Mm. But, so you need as many different sort of, you know, timbres and things as you could possibly get. Yeah. That makes sense. And if you were doing something of this scope today, like I know the the remote recording was a necessity of the pandemic, um, but if you're doing this today, would you still use remote recording or would you try to do something a little more traditional and in person in terms of the production process? It's handy to have the option of remote recording because it means that you can get someone who's on a different continent. Mm. Um, And I think Christina, who played Anne, was. I think she was in New York. At the time, she was in New York. She's now in the UK. But, uh, yeah, she was in NYC at the time. Yeah, although there were certain instances where we were like, ah, their recording setup is bad. (laughs) This is... This is 10 times harder because of that. It would have been so much easier to, well, for a start, it would have been very nice to record everyone on our nice mics, but also it would have been very nice to just be in the room when they're doing a song Mm. to just go, "Ah, would you mind just uh, trying this, that and the other? Um, And things like Anne and Mary's songs together. Yeah. Yeah, that, you, that was you having to play the other one sometimes, wasn't it? Well, what we would do, yes, yeah, so I, I did a demo of everyone in my horrible falsetto or sometimes pitch shifting my voice up an octave into, into Christina Bianco range. Um, but I think what we did with duets was we would get Christina to record her part first and then we'd send that to Suze so that she could d- match Christina's performance um, and that would have been a lot easier, obviously, yeah. if they'd been in the same room. And they were actually friends as well, so it was sort of annoying that we couldn't just all get in the same room yeah. together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. So, yeah, we do a mixture, I think. That's what we do nowadays, a mixture of remote and studio time. Mm. It's nice to have it as an option rather than the only option, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Uh, if you were addressing people who are thinking about doing podcast musicals, perhaps they have some stage experience, um, what what cautionary tales would you offer or what advice would you give in terms of the overall process? Hmm. Yeah, what are the pitfalls that people tend... I mean, it very much depends on the project. If you're doing essentially like a song cycle, then um, it's, you know, something that's more liminal, less sound design-y, I guess, then um, that might be an easier thing to achieve like with a good cast and and so on you you could uh, you know in a well-rehearsed cast you could probably go to a studio and and knock it out fairly quickly Um, but then perhaps you could argue you wouldn't be ending up necessarily with you know something that is like a podcast musical like an audio drama musical it would be perhaps just a sort of original cast recording Um, Yes, but so you need a decent sound designer then. I, case, I, I think that's what I'm sort of working towards, yeah, mm. is that uh, for it to feel like um, something like what we've done, it you you do need to probably collaborate with a, a, 
uh, experienced sound designer if that's not something that you do. Uh, it's easier said than done, of course. But yeah, um, yeah, because you'd worked, you had your own studio at, uh, in our garden, mm. <laughs> and you'd been working in that capacity for years, hadn't you? Yeah. So if you don't want to have to learn that kind of thing from the ground up, and you can do, there are a lot of audio drama uh, podcasters out there who have actually gained the skills from doing these things. Mm. Um, but if you don't want to have to do that, yeah, you would have to budget for a sound designer, sound editor, and that is a big job. Yeah. It is a hugely laborious process. Dialogue editing, if you, I mean, particularly if you're doing it remotely or, you know, recording actors individually, dialogue editing takes way, way, way longer than you think it's going to. Um, Although uh, we recently recorded a almost a two-hander mm. and we had them in the same room. And because they were in the same room and they were vibing off each other, that dialogue editing is so much easier. It's coming together a lot quicker. Yeah. So if you can get them all in the room and you can get some nice uh, uh, takes where everyone is nailing it, <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> then then you don't have to cut it up like we were we were doing. Yeah, that is and that true. would speed it up tremendously. I think. Yeah, because a lot of the remote uh, editing, the remote recorded stuff, is you have to fabricate the natural flow of conversation because you're putting each line in like that. Mm, so sometimes you'll think, oh, that take was lovely. We really want to use that. And then you put it with the other takes and you realise the energies are completely different and, and you can't use that lovely take anymore. You have yeah. to use something else. So, yeah, it is nicer if you can get them in the same room. So that would help. Yeah. Um, but that tends to be tricky and quite expensive to get them. Yeah. The same Although... Um, Talking of money, I, I think it's good to talk about money because people are like, oh, no, it's art. Let's not talk about yeah. that. <laughs> but that, that could be another pitfall. You could end up uh, not budgeting enough or budgeting too much, actually, because it's a lot cheaper than than a lot of mediums, isn't it? Like, uh, it's going to be cheaper than putting a short film together, probably. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think, so Anne and Mary had a cast of 12? 12-ish, yeah. 12, yeah. We didn't pay ourselves enough, really, considering how much work we did. But we did still pay ourselves, and we got a grant for, oh, how much was it? It was like 20... 26,000. 26,000 pounds. So how much is that in dollars? In uh, sure. thir 32-ish. Okay. Yeah. And that was paying everyone nicely as well, because we wanted, we didn't want to, uh, you know, we were, we were asking people with really good pedigrees to do this, so you can't just you can't be like, hey, mates rates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 30 quid, is that all right? <laughs> especially, especially during a, a time when no one was able to work. As well, yeah, so. yeah. So we paid them proper rates and everything. And yeah, that's how much it cost. And that so. funding came from Arts Council England, which uh, is the UK's government body for arts funding. And, and um, I think applications below £30,000 are considered small grants. Yeah. Which seems like an awful lot of money to us, but uh, it's still a small grant. Yeah, we had been working on such micro budgets <laughs> for our own shows. We were like, £25,000? <laughs> yeah, what we can you do could, with this. Yeah, money. yeah, we could buy a Caribbean island yes. for that. Uh, but yeah, um, but then, you know, you talk to other people in, in uh, proper theatre <laughs> and TV and things, and yeah. they're like, that is nothing. It's a drop in the ocean. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and and we were very ambitious with what we did as well. Mm. I'd say that's our most expensive project to date. Oh, it is definitely. Yeah, and, by some stretch. And yeah, toughest, trickiest one that we've done. Yeah. But I mean, so yeah, it's without yeah. budget first. That's why we say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is a compliment that it it sounds expensive. Uh, the <laughs> production quality and just the, the sound mix, the things that we take for granted in a polished product, but I know they're the result of a lot of work. So I, I think you've got your your arts council's money's worth from the uh, from the project. Right. <laughs> this Thanks. might be a good occasion to turn to our attendees today and see if they have any questions uh, that they would like to put forth. Um, Elise, do they have access to the chat? Can they type up with impunity, or do we need to curate? Yes, everybody has everybody has uh, easy access to the chat, and if you want to raise your hand, I can also uh, you can unmute and turn on your camera, whatever you want. We're informal here, so please feel free to jump in. And if they all have stage fright, I can stall with some more uh, <laughs> questions. No. As well. 
questions that I had as you were going along, um, you answered as you were going along because I did. I, I was questioning what do you when you're recording remotely, how on earth do you manage to um, get everybody's to sound like they weren't remote, especially when they all have different microphones? I assume. Yeah, and room quality. We had someone who had a really uh, lots of hard, shiny surfaces, and mm. so their voice was bouncing off a bit, and that was yeah. quite tough for you, wasn't it? Yes, and they, they said, oh, I'd like to do it in this room because I sound great in this room. I was like, I'm sure you do. But, uh, <laughs> but now that's not yeah, what you, we... You need it as dry as possible, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we kind of guided our actors to uh, set themselves up with a lot of soft furnishings around them and things like that, mm -hmm. and uh, they'd send little snippets to Lawrence and yeah. uh, he would listen to them and see if they were all right. I could try and direct them a little bit. And, and uh, otherwise it was software, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I had to invest in some very good EQs and things to, to try and make it uh, work. So a couple of questions. Um, yeah, Dav, you had your hand up. Do you want to go ahead? Uh, Hi, yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for doing this talk. Really appreciate it. I actually listened to this podcast long before this um, this meeting was scheduled. So I was collecting podcast musicals and trying to listen to them all at one point. Um, so uh, my question for you is, how did you handle like publicity after it was done? How did you what was the sort of release plan and getting the word out and making sure people knew about it so they could download it and listen to it? How'd you go about that? Uh, so part of our grant was uh, marketing. And so we hired a PR company. But uh, it turned out that as good as they were, that is not what translates to downloads when it comes to audio drama. Mm. Uh, so from our experience in audio drama, the best thing is actually word of mouth, really. Yeah. Um, and a good hook. Yeah. And I think what we know now that we didn't know then, even uh, sort of 18 months ago, when we put this out, it would have been very useful to, to know a few things now, which is um, don't be afraid to uh, sort of put other things on your feed. You can arrange, uh, sorry, your podcast feed, this is, you can arrange uh, cross promotion with other podcasts. Oh, yeah. That is by far the best way to get people to listen. Mm. So if you were to uh, also um, with that in mind, uh, short uh, episodic things aren't as popular as long, great big, huge seasons. Mm. So you actually want to keep that feed alive. And that's how you get people listening to it. So the way to do that is to, to arrange with a podcast that you really enjoy a feed swap. So uh, they drop an episode of your thing on theirs and you take an episode of theirs and you drop it on your feed. and uh, yeah, if you if you keep that, so if you drop five episodes and that's it, you never touch it ever again, you're going to struggle to get people to listen to it in an ongoing fashion. Yeah. Whereas if you keep that feed alive with feed drops and things, you, you really can. And that's, yeah, that's one of the best things we've done, actually, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, uh, that's a, a sort of fairly comparatively recent discovery, but it's been super helpful. Yeah. And yeah, just making a, a lot of friends on the internet is... <laughs> Is kind of, as always, is always the way. The audio drama community is really, really alive on the internet. They're, they're tight-knit. Uh, they all know each other. They yeah. all, uh, they're all super enthusiastic. Yes. And any new shows, if you go and kind of, uh, particularly Twitter, I mean, who knows how long Twitter's going to exist, but uh, the, the audio drama community on Twitter is very vibey, um, but also on Reddit and Tumblr as well. Um, so those forums are, are good places to, to look at. Yeah, it's really fan driven. So the ones who listen to audio dramas absolutely hoover up as many uh, audio mm. dramas as they can. But yeah, I guess the best takeaway is don't spend very much money. Yeah, on PR. On yeah, PR. it's not necessary. It's not very necessary. The best, the best way to get out there is actually completely free because you don't pay for feed swaps or anything like that. Uh, we had a question from the group. Um, someone was asking, after you have um, posted it, does more money come in through advertising or through anything else? Do you get more income from the podcast? Yes. Yes. So we we are part of a network uh, called Fable and Folly, which uh, our three shows are represented by the Fable and Folly Network, which is a, a network of fiction podcasters, and they represent our podcast to advertisers. So we run ads on uh, all of our shows. But uh, interestingly, with Anne and Mary in particular, one of the other revenue streams that we found really helpful is merch. Mm. Um, this, like uh, a larger proportion of people 
um, by Anne and Mary merch. Uh, so that's we, we've print um, programs, we've got some CDs and so on. Uh, a larger proportion of people buy Anne and Mary merch than buy the merch for our show that gets more downloads. Mm. Um, so I think um, with a musical, people are really keen to buy the music. So you can also, we, we sell on Bandcamp, um, a kind of cast album with just the songs as a, as a track list, uh, as you would buy a soundtrack album from a stage musical or a cast recording from a stage musical. And that is surprisingly lucrative. Great. And, and uh, similarly, you, you were just talking about um, the Internet Society on, on Twitter, on Reddit and the various people who are into podcasts. How do you find those people on those various platforms? Uh, so you literally just search for audio drama. And, uh, oh, and if you start listening to audio dramas, um, generally, there's a fan community out there. So uh, say so there's a very popular one at the moment called Midnight Burger. So you just Google Midnight Burger and you'd see all the people talking about it. And then, uh, and so it's just a way of kind of like, and then if you listen to it and you've got opinions on it, you can kind of integrate into that community. And, and it's just creating conversations between people who enjoy this, this medium. So it's actually, it's, it's fairly easy to, to find them out there. This is a good segue into a, a general question of, uh, can you give us your online whereabouts, uh, your social media accounts, uh, websites, all that good stuff? So um, I'll just quickly address this. Somebody asked in the chat, um, where do we sell uh, the records? And that is Bandcamp, um, which if you've not checked out, is a very, very good way to sell music online. Um, so we have our Bandcamp page, which is longcatmedia.bandcamp.com, but you can find everything on our website, which is longcatmedia.com. And we're on uh, the three big socials, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Yeah, uh, we need to get on Tumblr because apparently that's where a lot of audio drama people hang out, but I don't understand Tumblr. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel like I haven't got the brain space for it, at yeah. like, <laughs> but that's a future thing. Yeah. But yes, do go to longcatmedia com and you can find everything there. Groovy. Do we have any other questions from the peanut gallery? All right. Well, you have been both very generous with your time and uh, in sharing your expertise and perspectives on this. So thank you both so much for joining us here today. Yeah, thanks a lot. Not at all. A pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Yes, we really appreciate it. And I know there's going to be some people who are going to watch the recording afterwards and want to find out more about it. So thank you so much for your time. No worries. Pleasure. Thank you for having us. All right. Great. Well, we'll let you enjoy what's what's left of Saturday night over there. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, more from you uh, online and elsewhere. Yeah. So definitely go to longcatmedia.com and check out the ballad of Anne and Mary and everything else that they're working on. And, uh, and hopefully we'll all see each other in the world of podcasts in the future. Cool. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care. And bye-bye.